Welcome back to another episode of the RAG Report podcast, where I bring you a daily bulletin show from recruitment owners, advisors, suppliers, investors around the world who are prepared to give their advice, their, their take on what's going on right now through the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can all come through this stronger, fitter and better. Um, today, I'm joined by Chris Redmond. Chris is the founder and CEO of Red Halt Search and Selection, um, a very niche specialist recruitment business who work with organizations in a really critical point of their their journey where recruitment is absolutely fundamental. And Chris brings a, a project management background to the recruitment process to fundamentally guarantee clients that they will get the return that they, they need for critical roles. Um, if you've listened to the RAG podcast before, you might know Chris from season two. I interviewed him about six, seven months ago, so it'd be good to find out what he's been up to since then. Um, and uh, let's chew the fat because I see this guy everywhere. Before I do start with Chris, I want to message. Um, I want to want to give you the first message from our first sponsor, Rise Recruitment Ventures. These guys got on board with the Rag Podcast this month to um, let you guys know that they are still looking to support recruitment businesses all over the world right now. Rise is a recruitment investment business that specifically works with high growth recruitment businesses. So either startups or early stage organizations with founders who are looking to scale and exit. John and Alex, in 10 years before, they scaled a business from zero to 100 million, 100 plus staff and sold for 20 million. They're now putting in their capital and their time to help grow uh, the next generation of startups. And if you want to find out more, you can visit www.riserv.co.uk. I'll tag everything in this post. Right. Without further ado, let's get back to the show. Chris, welcome to the RAG Report. Good to see you again, mate. How are you it's always doing? good. It's always good to see you, mate. But today you're in the uh, you're in the newly formed Red Hulk Clubhouse, aren't you? So it looks very suave in the background. I am. It was something that I spoke about on our podcast in October last year. I think we were we were just doing the architectural plans for the construction. Um, then and now here I am sitting here in the Red Hulk Clubhouse, the, the clubhouse. heartbeat of our global. Empire. I love it, mate. Well, we're going to get into it in more detail. Tell us, for the, um, for the listeners' benefit, um, I've asked everyone the same question, right? Paint the picture. What the hell is your life like right now? Um, I'd say it's Uber everything at the moment. And by that, I don't mean Uber Eats. What I mean is mega Driving focus. Driving an Uber, the whole yeah. thing. Mega focus. You know, there's never been a time in my life where my diet, my exercise, my mindset, my self-reflection, uh, my ability to think about my impact on others and, and what I want to generate from my own life. All of that has really come under the microscope through being forced to be at home, I suppose, lockdown. And, um, you know, on the 14th of March, um, Amanda, the co-founder of Red Hulk, and her sister, Ellis, who also works with us, got back from Dubai. And we went into an immediate lockdown because, as you know, Sean, we've got a six-month-old here. And um, just seeing the trend of things emerging already posed a risk that I felt was too great to face. Yeah. So we just went into lockdown and immediately, you know, we went into, as you know, I won't, I won't um, go into too much detail, but a super level of exercise. I went into overdrive when it comes into ensuring that our brand profile was elevated to a level beyond what it's ever been. And really, really also started to deconstruct our proposition and um, what we do, how we do, how we do it and what we achieve because I knew that I needed to pivot that to make sure that it was still pertinent for the market that we're in. So and, let's, and go, least, let's go back then. So obviously when, when this, you said, tell us a bit more about that story. So Amanda was in Dubai when it was all kicking off. Yeah. So, you know, I and know, knowing the dates that she was the way I was here with Alfie, our son on the 13th of March yeah. and her, her and Ellis went over to Dubai for, that was the Friday days. I shut my office. I think. Yeah, I think it was mate. Yeah. So, you know, we could see a fairly distinct characteristic emerging to the, to what was happening. And, um, we were watching it and watching it whilst the girls were in Dubai. And then they got back that Sunday night, which I think was the 14th of March. And immediately, you know, as they, walked through the door uh, i think ellis was going to grab a drink and then head home and we just had a quick chat and i said you know ellis has got a bag full of stuff she just stay in and um and literally she only left this weekend that was seven weeks ago so she's only just gone back to her apartment um so yeah i mean we went into 
they kind of self-imposed lockdown two and a half weeks ahead of when the government advised us that that's what we should all be doing. Yeah, yeah. So you you go into lockdown. Amanda flies back, no problem, no issues getting back to the UK at that point. You were due to go out, weren't you due to be in, in, in the Middle East as well? Do you know what, actually, I'd, that kind of slipped my mind, yeah, there's an organisation, a recruitment organisation that I work with over there based out of Dubai for the Middle East, uh, particularly Saudi Arabia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I, w- I was supposed to be driving to the airport while Amanda was driving back. I'd yeah. kind of forgotten that, actually. You're right. Mm. Um, but, you know, my trip got cancelled on the Sunday. I was speaking to James, the founder there, and we decided to reschedule it. So, um, so yeah, you're right. I was supposed to be flying out there for a big presentation that we were doing to a new client in Dubai. So how, was it, how did it, the changes start to come um, and affect the business? So Red Hole, obviously, lots of retained searches, big, high-profile roles. How, was, how did you find the, the change in the economy affected what you were doing at the time? Um, so I think the, the characteristic we decided to adopt in our response was to be crisp, to be succinct and to be a bit more tiger-like than puppy-like. And what I mean by that is be stealthy and intelligent about how we moved next. You know, there was a lot of panic going on. There's a lot of energy, a lot of wasted calories. And we just, you know, we were like, you know, we're good. Let's take stock of what we've got. Let's be objective. You know what, really, Sean, we adopted all the characteristics that we do anyway, Mm. every day in all of our searches. That remove the emotion type signature to what we do was fairly evident in how we responded as well. So talk talk me through it. So what does does that actually mean that you did? Well, the first thing that we did was take stock of exactly what we've got and what stage each process was at in terms of work in progress. So we did that. We do that every day anyway. Literally, that's how me and Amanda start the day every day. So we're never more than 24 hours apart from what the heartbeat of the business is telling us. So we looked at all of that. We communicate, we put out a communication immediately as a generic thing to all of our customers, mm-hmm. just saying that we'll carry on, uh, carrying on to adhere to all of the milestones that we have for all of our searches. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then within 24 hours, I'd done at least half an hour, if not an hour, on the phone with all of our, with all the decision makers and our customers as well. So I think from an objective perspective, we're able to gain credibility by knowing exactly where we were. There was no scramble, there was no loss of control. And that imparts a degree of comfort and therefore confidence, I think, in the subjective half, which was the conversations with all of those guys. So, you know, 48 hours after us going into our kind of self-imposed lockdown and watching what was going on globally, our control tower was functioning perfectly well. We knew exactly what was going on. We knew what was taking off, what was coming into land and what we had in the air from a metaphorical perspective. And, um, and that's the way we've carried on. That's the way we're still operating as of today. Did you see a change in the volume of work that was coming through? And Absolutely. You know, Sean, I think you mentioned it on the podcast that you did at the, at the spearhead of this series with Greg Savage. Yeah. Saying that anybody who says it's business as usual that ain't true. Yeah, yeah. this is usual. Nothing's going to be what usual used to mean to any of us anymore. And we did see that. We, we, you know, we saw a drop off. I think at the worst point in our internal metrics to about twenty percent of what our normal whip is, our work in progress. Mm. That's actually picked up over the course of the last month. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen some relative success, uh, which I'm extremely proud to say. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen you running around your, your garden on, on Instagram celebrating. So there's been some big wins, right? There's some huge wins, game changers. And you know what? I think, again, having followed your series and someone who you mentioned from Rise, John, um, you know, John Coxon, I think, was talking about the relativity on the horizon when it comes to business growth. Yes, you've probably got less competition at the moment, but at the same time, there's less opportunity as well. So, you know, you need to reorientate your approach, which is... Because we did that and we were at the start of a selection process for a big global player at the, at the start of this COVID thing, um, you know, we were in a massive RFP process. Um, and then when you saw me on Instagram skipping around the garden, we had just been advised that we'd been down selected as, as one of the, not just finalists, you know, to agree terms, which we've now subsequently done. It's baked. So... Um, so that's a game changer for us. And we've got another one of those in flight as well. So, so has there been any new work? Has there been much new work or has it been an evolution of the stuff you already had on? 
both, but actually, in terms of the blend, interesting point, Sean, in terms of the blend of our work and revenue, most of it is incremental to existing clients. Since COVID, the blend of our work has been 80% new clients. Wow. What do you put that down to? People recommending us and our approach. You know, because of its high degree of assurance, extremely forensic characteristic, and the kind of vernacular that we adopt, you know, it's, it's more special forces than infantry. You know, it's a get the job done, high impact, high degree of assurance, get us involved. You can be pretty sure that you're going to, what you're going to need, you're going to get. And I think that in these times when every hiring decision is even more critical than ever, people are looking for that sort of assurance. And, and the, the big new business that we've got has been from recommendations. Wow. So for me, it's been a really powerful validation of what I had hoped the DNA of our service felt like to our clients. And I've seen, obviously you're doing work with us and we've, we've been working together on some stuff like webinars and your daily content. And I've been, I mean, just watching you from afar has been amazing to see the evolution of not what you were already doing, but the pace at which you picked up like, and did and, and moved because a lot of people are just now starting to get onto this whole, well, if I put content out and help and add value, I can support people. Whereas you, you've been doing it for a while, but you went into a bit like me, like into overdrive. As soon as this happened, you're like, fuck it. I'm going to do more than anyone else. And it's, it's been yeah. great to see what's it, what, what's the impact been like for you as a result of that? Well, you know, first of all, one of the things that I would say, Sean, as a compliment to you, mate, is having you on my wing or Hoxo on the wing of Red Hulk to be thought leaders on all that content and assessment of our impact on the market really helped me to get into the gear that I've now been in for the last six weeks. You know, the Code Red webinar series has been fantastically well received. You know, that was kind of born of a conversation you and I had. We had about nine o'clock at night, didn't we, on FaceTime? <laughs> <laughs> and you know actually to be fair i think that was your idea that you know this this really fits with the, with the dna of your brand you should consider doing something you came like up it. with the name code red within about 10 seconds you texted me straight away with a with code red an emoji of yourself and said oh, by the way i've already got like five people lined up i was like we fucking came up with it three minutes ago so um that's what i love working people like you because uh I'm quite, I like the ideas generation process, but, and some, a lot of people get excited about that and then they don't take action. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, fitness. I always really like in what we do to fitness because I think it's so similar. Like you can have all the, the theory in the world. If you don't take action, you'll never get fit. And I think it's the same with your brand. It's the same with your recruitment process. It's all about action. And you, you did that. So over the last, how many webinars have you had now? About four or three or four over the last. On, on Friday, we did episode four of the yeah. series. Um, you know, we're getting kind of between 70 to 100 people registering though, though, on those now. And a pretty good percentage of those turn up. You know, it's like any event, you get a percentage drop. Yeah, of course, yeah. But one of the key metrics for me is that of the people that do turn up, 98% or more stay until the end. And the drop-off rate is a key metric on how engaging your content is. So I love doing those, you know. And I have to say, Gurney, in your team that backs us up on all of the stuff that really makes that happen is just exceptional you know she's really become part of the fabric of those events and our business as well yeah well she uh she, she'd say the same about you mate um but it's, look this is this is amazing to see because like i said you were already dialed in at a level i think based on the feedback from the first podcast like i you were one of the most one of the podcasts where people have messaged me and gone like that guy is on it kind of thing and it's it's great that 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 hasn't changed as a result of what's going on in the world. And I wouldn't have expected it to, but tell, let's go into a bit more of the personal side. Like, cause you said at the beginning, you've dialed into your, that's my doorbell by the way. And because we record this now at home, I can't do anything about it. Hopefully my wife. Just proves it's authentic. Sure. It's authentic. If that, if that is a word that anyone cares about, but it's probably Amazon. It's my wife. Collecting <laughs> from Amazon, right? And you can hear it. If it's for it's not for me cause I'm not ordering anything, but anyway. Um, so let's go into the personal side. Let's go into the mindset bit. So, less recruitment more taking fucking care and ownership of yourself i've watched you online on, i mainly see your stuff on instagram as a result of what you're doing outside of recruitment talk mm. us through what you've actually been up to as a result of covid from a personal perspective so i think that the you know i've always looked at other people who have taken actual sabbaticals and thought i wish i had the chance to do that at some point in my life and i feel like this has kind of forced me to act like I'm having one in a way, but I also know that I've got ridiculously high levels of energy and application as well. 
So I do a lot of stuff and in the first 30 days, I did, I did the marathon last year and, um, and in the first 30 days, I thought, what am I gonna do? Running has always been a passion of mine. It's great for your head as well as your body. So I decided to run 10 kilometers every day. So I did, you know, and that's 300 kilometers, obviously over the course of the 30 days, the first 30 days. So that's the equivalent of seven marathons. So I did seven marathons in the last 30 days. Did you have any blisters then, on your feet? No, nah, none. None? Oh, mate, I'm, yeah. I've been running a lot in this lockdown and I'm not a runner. I'm not, I've never been built for running. Even at football, I, was, I was, um, wasn't an endurance player, if you know what I mean. I was more of a luxury player, I think. But uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I've not got any niggles, no injuries, nothing yet, but I haven't done anywhere near that level of intensity and consistency. I've done like six, seven K every other day, pretty much. Um, every two to three days, whereas 10k a day every day has been insane. So, what what impact did that have on you mentally? But you know what, I've always I've always loved running. I used to play a lot of rugby in my teens, and um, and then I broke two bones in one season, which really knocked the momentum I had in that sort of rugby career out of wind out of my sails. But I used to do a lot of cross country then, and I've always done a lot of running. And the thing that I've always liked about it, from a psychological perspective, is that it's, running is a little bit like life. You know, you can stand still if you want, but you ain't going to be getting any closer to your destination. Wow. And wow that's a powerful line, isn't it? Fuck yeah. Well, the other, the other thing is, I think, you know, once you accept that it's hard, you make it easier. It's just exactly like life. It's tough. Just yeah. get over it and get moving. You know, I remember in the last two miles of the marathon last year with Ellis, who works for us. We did a marathon because Ellis couldn't run five kilometers six months before that. And I said, I'll train you. I'll get you over the line. And, um, and we did that and she really started to buckle in the last two miles. And I said, you don't fucking stop now. You haven't come this far just to come this far. Mm. And with tears in her eyes, she went over the line. You know, and, I, and the thing that I like about running is that it gives you that mindset of if I can do 10K every day, what can't I do? You know, it's just about keeping going. You don't even have to be running. As long as you're putting one foot in front of the other, you're getting closer to the, to the end goal, 10K in that case. That's it. And you're, you're, an, you're a morning riser. I'm, I'm an early morning guy. I'm like a 5.45 every day type person. You're, you, what are you, 5 a.m. club, is it? that you're, you're Yeah, 5 a.m. club. If you haven't read it, by Robin Sharma. Even if you only read the first chapter of that book, it's life-changing. It's my next audio book. I'm, I'm finished. When I finish Branson, which will be tonight, probably, it's got about half an hour left. So if I go for my room, I'll sort it out. And then I'll, I'm, I've already bought Robin Sharma's 5am club for, for audible. Not joking, Sean. By the time you finish, someone with your mindset as well, mate, by the time you finish that first chapter, you'll feel like you've got a submarine engine in your body. You're powered <laughs> on uranium. To give, it, give, give everyone a benef- like the benefit of what, what this is all about. Were you a 5am guy before or...? I was, yeah, but what the 5am club is about is about taking the first hour of your day to work out what the rest of your awake time is going to be, what you're going to do, how you're going to approach it, what you're going to achieve, how you're going to achieve it, what impact you're going to have on others. And the thing that it did for me was fine tune, kind of what I was already doing, but in a little bit more of an organic, messy way. It just locked me into... Okay, so paint a picture for us now then. What's the daily Chris Redmond routine? What, what happens from you from the minute you wake up? I want a bit of a minute by minute well, down. You know, so, so, you know, I've got a six-month-old in the house as well. So obviously, I, I actually, one of the things that is the light of my life is waking up, if I can, usually just before him and watching him when he wakes up. And when he makes eye contact with me, you get a big smile. It's just a phenomenal emotion. I bet, yeah. But... The, the, the general structure of my day is that I'll naturally wake up and never set an alarm. I'll naturally wake up at about five, certainly by half five latest. And I think that comes from when I used to work in the city. Mm. Um, so I'll naturally wake up like that. I'll get up, I'll go downstairs, generally have a barocca and uh, neck that in one go. Have a coffee, wake up, check my emails for 10 minutes. And, and, then, and then generally I hit the gym. I'm lucky enough to have a full gym in my house. And, uh, and I'll get in there. And honestly, even if it's only a half hour, 45 minute sesh, by the time six, half six at the latest comes around and I start to see emails coming in, people starting to emerge. You've already won. Mate, I'm ahead of the rest of the world. I've stolen <laughs> a lead. You're catching me up from that point. <laughs> I'm about, I'm a bit, yeah, mine at the minute is up at six, 6.15, I drink my water, like I'm on my, my half gallons that I'm doing. 
And then six thirty, I'm training till quarter past seven. And then at quarter past seven, I'm I usually clean up a bit, make myself a big cafeteria of two cups of coffee, and I sit and read ten pages of a physical book while Henry put Henry on my lap, little little dog. And that is my like, that's that's like the best. And then by eight o'clock, I've read it, I've done it all, and my wife's not even awake yet. At the minute she gets about half eight now, so that's my time then to spend half an hour just planning. I try not to look at my emails in the morning i'm trying to stay off i mean it's hard but i had an episode with katie maycock earlier in the season and she talked about how if you can if you can let the first half an hour well the first hour and the last hour of your day be email free and phone free effectively like you you you're prioritizing yourself over anybody else's agenda um which i quite like that you know what we took we flew a sales trainer out to mykonos last year to train us for a weekend there's a guy called Lucas Moralia, and if you don't know him, you should definitely look him up. I'm lucky enough to have worked with Luca, and he's become a really close personal friend as well. But Luca, well, he's literally a rocket scientist for a start. And, you know, people say that about clever people. Luca literally is, you know. When um, Luca, when I was working with Luca, he had this thing of being an outlook slave. And, then, and he's right. He often used to talk about people will sit there with outlook open all the time. Now it's Gmail, it was Outlook then. And, and as, soon as, it, as soon as it goes ding and the email comes in, you stop what you've been doing and you go to that. And then you half do that. And then you get another ding. And then you stop that and you start doing the next thing. And that has created a bit of a perpetual motion of yeah. people only doing half things. There's a great app actually, Sean, that I've discovered in lockdown called Boomerang for Gmail. Right. And you install it on um, Google Chrome and you can pause your inbox. And um, it's just fantastic because you can, like when you're on a call or something, you can pause your inbox and, and set how long you want to pause it for. Or you can set when you want to pause your inbox every day of the week at different times if you want. So for people like me that have got a bit of an inner geek that likes to play, I've loved having Boomerang. And the other thing you can set when you send an email is that if you don't get a response in a certain amount of time, it will put your email back to the top of your inbox to remind you to chase it up and follow up. Wow. And I think stuff like that that just minimise leakage from an effectiveness perspective in times like this where opportunities are low and and the distance. So would you would you worry then that if let's say you put your inbox on pause for two hours at eight o'clock till ten, I don't know why, but you you're in the middle of an RFP or something. Would you worry that anything could happen that would be uber urgent or is too, too nothing's yeah. going to affect? You can't get back in two hours, right? I don't um, honestly, Sean. If this might sound contentious, but if someone leaves me a voicemail, it's not going to get listened to. I don't listen to voicemails. Um, WhatsApp is generally the best way to get hold of me. Um, email now, I probably feel about email the way that people do around regular post. You know, I'll, I'll come in, check my emails. I kind of think, pick up the phone or WhatsApp me. You know, it's, if something's important enough and you need my immediate attention, you'd do that anyway. Yeah. Uh, email now is something that I just kind of sift through. Oh, well, I do run a pretty strict policy on in my inbox. You know, I clear it down. Oh, I've never got anything in it. The only stuff in my inbox is stuff that I need to action. See, I'm the other way. I've, I've got thousands of emails, but they're all read. Like, I've read everything. So there's nothing unread, but I don't think you've ever deleted a single email. <laughs> yeah, I used to be like that. And, 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 and it kind of bothered me at the back of my mind that there was just like 50,000 emails, I think, at the height of it. Yeah. And then I thought, now I'm going to do this. And I just got rid of all of them. Just got rid of them. And, and now I run a policy of clean inbox. Yeah, I suppose it's like cleaning your house or your room or anything, isn't it? That kind of mindset. So, you, so you're up at five. You've got your, your, your first hour is sort of half an hour. It's about planning, spending time with your son, etc. Then what's, your, what's the rest of your day like? Because, again, I've seen you flying drones around your garden on Instagram. I've seen you running 10Ks at half 10, 11. You seem to have, like, this fluidity that is a bit like you're on a sabbatical, but you're still doing deals. You still – how are you managing it all? Just planning. Just literally planning it out. You know, you know, Sean, probably as well, if not better than anyone. I think you get the spirit of the philosophy of our business, which, as digital nomads, is one where we, we've never subscribed to convention. Mm. And I think that – when you're as able as we are to do what we do, and then you ditch convention, which is only going to be a limitation when you're a very competent team, um, you can start to achieve the unconventional level of success. And that's what we're lucky enough to have experienced at Red Hole. So, you know, 
nine to five is not really what, how any of us work at Red Hole. We do what we need to do when we need to do it. And, you know, at, at the same time as when you see me, you know, jogging with my drone following me, at the same time, if a, if a client needed something or we had a looming milestone coming towards us, mate, I'd be working from five o'clock in the morning till midnight to make sure that that happened. Yeah, so it's just about prioritizing and planning. That's what you're saying yeah, to me. One, one interesting comment, if you go back to our original conversation on the on the first episode, was about your office, and you were saying how you were about to go office free. You were um, you were saying what was it? Was it December first or January first? You were you were you were you would no so, longer. Have, so, so I mean, now that looks like an absolute masterstroke because people are everywhere around the world are paying for fucking offices and they're not getting any access to them. So you must be sat there a little bit smug about it. I'm really glad I got rid of it now. I'm not smug, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't get where you're coming from, but I, I feel for those companies that have got yeah. anything, no matter how much it is between, you know, I've got loads of mates, good mates that run recruitment companies, you know them as well, Sean. They've got to generate 10K a month just to pay for the, the space they can't even use now. They can't yeah. even go to it. Thanks. And it's harder than ever to generate that 10K. So. I feel for them, I really do, and I feel like we were so lucky to, in August last year, have decided that we were going to pursue a 2020, year 2020 digital nomad strategy. We started planning for it in October, i.e. letting our people work from home, and then we cut loose from our office contract at the 1st of December. So, you know, mid-March, when everybody gets forced to work from home, any turbulence, any different personalities, politics, suspicions that people aren't really working properly all that we we'd already got through all of that crap and um and again it allowed us to focus and remain a and maintain a degree of composure that a lot of people didn't have a choice about they just had to dive headfirst into lockdown yeah, true but you did then decide to build the clubhouse so tell us a bit more about that and what what, what that looks like yeah so the clubhouse what we recognized one of the lessons of the first few months of digital nomad being a digital nomad was that occasionally people like to have a desk and they like to know what the home of the business that they work for or as I call it the cave of the tribe that they belong to where is that you know the meat that I'm killing where do I drag it back to to feed the tribe so we needed somewhere that was the home of the business so we've got the place that I'm in now built um, our clubhouse we've got eight desks in here it's a full setup uh, it's outside of our home, so nobody has to come through the house to get here. It's a separate building. Um, and the, the nature of what this location represents, and the reason why we chose to call it a clubhouse and not an office, is that people can come here whenever they want. If they never want to come here, they don't have to. If they want to come here every day, they can. You know, it's a little bit like the golf club or the football club or the rugby club. Yeah. It's really up to you as a member of that tribe how you want to occupy the cave. And it's that sort of mentality, really. And you know what? Because of lockdown, our guys haven't even been here, but they've helped us choose every bit of furniture. Mm. We, at every stage of the build, we were taking pictures when the construction contractors were here and, and saying, now, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So for me, it'll be a proud day when we've got the rest of the theme in here as well. We've also got it configured so that we can use it as a, something that we'll be talking about later on in the year, which, is a, which will be a Red Hulk Academy as we think there'll be a massive opportunity to grow for us once things start to relax. And with the equity that we've driven into the brand over the course of the lockdown, we might want to capitalize on that. So the clubhouse might also act as um, the, the academy. as the we training. It, configure yeah. it as a training room. Well, I think, I think that's one thing that I've spotted. And, and I don't know your thoughts on this, but I think there'll be so much opportunity off the back of this and it'll come in different shapes and sizes, but one of the biggest challenges is going to be clients and businesses that enjoy the lockdown in terms of the remote nature of the doing the job are going to wonder how they're going to train rookies or people in, in their style. Um, and, and I think that might be where the, the kind of sweet spot of having a physical office becomes. You might not need as big a space as you did before, but you need, you might need somewhere to incubate people for three to six months or whatever to get them to the standard where they can go and work wherever they want to work. And that, I guess that's the mindset you've got. That place becomes the training hub for the new blood and then they all fly the nest, if you like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I read a lot of military strategy books. And if you look at the way that the U uh, British military have had pop-up training facilities for other locations, you know, such as the Ecuadorian um, military fighting the drug wars, you know, it's a pop-up training facility, highly structured, 
you know, highly you're clear about what you want to achieve with a blueprint that don't really change. That's what I'm making now for us. And my thoughts, Sean, are, are that if I wanted to run a pop-up academy for Red Hole in Edinburgh, California, Sydney, wherever I wanted to, I, not only I could do that, but I could get, you know, James Gilbert, one of our top guys, or Meg, or Ellis, you know, they could do it because they're part of the fabric of our business. They're all shareholders as well. So that, you know, that was part of the idea. We were actually about to send Ellis to the Middle East when all of this started. And um, she was looking at places to locate herself from when this happened. So this has just allowed me to accelerate on developing all of the content for the academy, really, pop-up academies. Well, it's the same name as we've chosen for our Hoxo Academy for the similar reason. It's like, you know, working with people like you at the same time as what Hoxo are doing it. For me, that's the perfect blend because it means I get the opportunity to tap in and help people at a personal level while the business is doing the, the, the business side. And there's just so many people out there that don't have the knowledge of how to build a brand. They don't understand the content. So the, the Hoxo Academy for me was all about working at, with, with individual recruitment owners rather than just having to worry about the whole business piece can be, why don't we just plug in one-on-one -on -one for a while? And um, that's been, we were about to launch today or tomorrow we're launching our first Academy and we've had just under a hundred applications from recruitment owners. So it's uh, there's a lot of people out there in the world that need this help and people need your help. People need my help. And these lockdowns push us to innovate faster than potentially we would have in the past, which is exciting. Do you, do you know what, Sean? I think that it's a great moment as well. I learned this when I was operations director at Colt, the, the telecoms company. When the shit hits the fan, you get a unique opportunity to reveal your true colours. It's easy to be grey and say all the right things when things are easy and when things are good and everything's on an upward trajectory. When things are challenging and the back's against the wall and all that sort of stuff, people see who you really are then. And it's even harder to hide it if you have been bullshitting. And I think that, um, you know, I can think of three other agencies, maybe even four, that I've helped the CEO of just by revealing in a totally unveiled sense what we do and how we do it and how I do business generation and new business development. Um, you know, and they're like, wow, Chris, it's amazing for me how open you are with us. And I'm like, well, you know what, guys? It's not actually about knowing what to do. It's about doing it. So yeah. I, could tell, I, could, I could tell you I run 10K every day, to be, to be fair. You've still got to run the 10K if you want to get fit. And it's yeah. the same thing about methodologies and our methodology. So you're right. I've been really open within the industry to try and help the good guys. Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely evident to see. Um, final question before we go, because I know we're both running out of time. What... What do you think is going to be the new world over the next? Like how are we going to come out of this lockdown next week? Are we going to? How do you see the economic um, factor? Well, how do you do? How do you do? Is rising back to an economic place where it's stronger and getting stronger progressively? I think there'll be a few headline characteristics, Sean. Number one, I think what we will see is what we're beginning to see in Spain and other countries that were more severely affected than us, which will be a staggered recovery, staged, staggered, very consistent with checkpoints to make sure that it's still going in the right direction. The second thing is that I think there will be a strong undercurrent return to buoyancy in most of our established economies. Um, and well, by that, what I mean is that it will start slowly and then it will re-emerge. And then I think what we'll see is a massive trajectory, a tidal wave, almost a surge of confidence come back. My prediction is that that will probably become very evident late September, October, beginning in November. I think we'll start to see it then. And the reason that I think that is because there were no economic restrictions behind what we're currently encountering. It was a health thing so nothing's broken economically in fact if anything this has given the chance to, for everyone to do a pit stop and make sure that they're ready from a fiscal and business proposition perspective and the final thing that i'd say across business and personal life is that it won't be the same as it ever was you know social distancing i think will be at the back of our mind forever now i think we're going to see i did a personal podcast on my blog about these face masks and actually there are a number of there are a number of different um, fashion providers now who, when you go and you buy something, you actually, you know, they, you get the outfit and it comes with the face mask as well to match the outfit. No way. No way. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send, I'll send you the blog. So, um, yeah, I, I think once the vaccine comes out, it's... I can't imagine the social distancing should be every, in everyone's head, but at the same time, 
it's probably taught us that this could happen again any time. I think if you look at Spanish flu and all, it's, it's a, they, they reckon there's a hundred year gap in, and, it, and it'll come back or this type of thing will happen again, but it could happen a lot quicker. Yeah, so we got a bit interrupted on my last point then, but I think there will be, my point was going to be, it, there won't be, it'll be a new normal. That's the yeah. point really, sure. It won't be the way. I get it. Look, Chris, always a pleasure, mate. Loved having you on again. Um, I love how you, if, if people, if you're not following Chris, get him on LinkedIn and also get him on Instagram if you're on there. Um, I don't even use Instagram myself at the moment, but I like watching you every day. You keep me, you keep me entertained. Um, are you, as always, Chris, if anyone does want to reach out and ask you any questions, you're open to it, right? Massively. It's a huge part of how I operate, mate. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I won't put your mobile number out so people can WhatsApp you, but I'll get them to message you on LinkedIn. All right. Um, so drop Chris a message guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed another episode of the rag report. Um, bringing you a daily um, insight into what's going on around the world. Uh, if you did enjoy this episode, do me one favor. I'm not asking for any money, but I'm asking for you to share it. So get on LinkedIn, put your comments on there post um, about the show, send it via WhatsApp or text or whatever to people you know, because the more we get listening, the more we're going to come through this, or the more chance we've got of everyone coming through this in a better shape. I'll be back again tomorrow with more insights. In the meantime, stay safe and I'll see you soon.